Richie Heron is now considering suing the NHS over allegations that he was pressured as an adult into surgery. Richie no longer identifies as a trans woman and he firmly believes that the clinics need to be more thorough in their assessments before encouraging life-changing operations. Kira Bell was born female and transitioned aged just 16. She was prescribed puberty-blocking drugs but regretted the decision six years later following a double mastectomy. In 2020, she took Tavistock's gender identity service to the High Court and won. The controversial clinic has now been shut down. Both Richie Heron and Kira Bell join me now. Thank you both ever so much for joining me. Kira, I want to come to you first about this. Can you give us just a brief uh, background to what happened to you when you were 15 years old and you decided to make this uh, journey into transitioning? Yeah, uh, so I was dealing with uh, a lot of issues at the time regarding... Uh, my sexuality uh, and um, just general mental health, really. Um, and, uh, yeah, just struggling with my place in the world. Um, and I uh, went to the GP um, and I was referred to a local mental health service. Um, and I was shortly then passed on to the Tavistock. Um, and, uh, yeah, it wasn't long. It was about four appointments um, before I was referred for puberty blockers. And it basically just snowballed from there. And you were dealing with various things. I mean, you were what what's, where you've described yourself as a tomboy uh, and you were struggling with uh, your being gay as well at the same time. Why was it that the Tavistock didn't explore these other aspects of what might be going on there rather than assuming uh, that there was a gender issue? Uh, well, that's a good question. I mean, um, it was very obvious that there's um, some... I mean, I'm, I'm not sure at the extent of the political influence at the time, but it was definitely... Uh, beginning to happen and um you know what once you once your eyes the as the patient there uh kind of uh declared myself as trans that was pretty much it and um there wasn't any further uh discussion because uh whatever the kid says that's supposed to be um the truth and 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 no debate basically so um, well, so, yeah, they're, they're, this, this is what they've described as gender affirmative uh, a process, where they, they simply affirm the statement that's made by the, the child in question. Uh, and Richie Heron, can I bring you in now? Because um, you were older, weren't you, when you started your, your uh, transitioning? Can you tell us a bit about that? Hi, Andrew. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was 25 when I started the process and 26 when I medically transitioned. And I had um, the surgery. Um, two days before my 31st birthday. Um, so I was a, like, a fully developed adult, fully developed brain, as they say. But I had all the vulnerabilities that Kira had too. I was gay. I had um, severe OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, severe depression. Um, I had a history of bullying at school. I had um, an internet addiction too and a variety of mental health issues which were were kind of trapped separately. It was like, you can be a trans person and have these mental health issues, not that you have these mental health health issues, which is why you are transitioning. And um, that clarity for me came too late, which was after surgery, which is a very, very, um, you know, it, ground, it, it ground, grounds you in reality. You know, you can't escape the things that you have to deal with every day. Um, for me, I've got urinary issues, going to the toilet and uh, general pain. I've wrote extensively about this um, online. And it wasn't just that the surgery had led to these things, but I'd refused it multiple times. And people don't understand when you are, you're not very well in yourself anyway, and you've got mul not one but multiple medical professionals not just telling you that this is the route, this is the best thing for you, this is the, the best pathway, um, and you really do eventually start to believe it, um, even though the reality was very, very simple. It wasn't very complex. I was can, gay, and I hated being gay. Can I ask you about this, Richie? Uh, Kira has mentioned uh, just four appointments with the Tavistock, and that was all it took. In your case... Uh, how many? How many appointments? How many? How much discussion was there uh, before this process began? Um, what originally, because of the wait for the gender clinic, which I eventually did get enrolled in, I got a full private diagnosis by an NHS GP um, privately um, under two sessions in two days, and I got the full diagnosis for transsexualism, which was later referenced um, for surgery. 
So it was really at that moment, it was decided for me um, and there was no question about it. I mean, this is remarkably quick. Kira, can, can I ask you about that? Because in both of your cases, I mean, Rich is talking about struggling with being a gay man. You yourself uh, were struggling with being a gay woman. Uh, to, and there have been whistleblowers at the Tavistock that have said the same thing, that actually sometimes parents are struggling with the idea of having a gay child. To what extent is there a kind of anti-gay or possibly even homophobic uh, element to this, this, this situation? I think it's pretty ingrained in the whole... Uh, situation really uh, across the globe. I mean, um, you know, society in general is, is uncomfortable with it. And um, I think this is unfortunately um, considered a solution to an extent. Um, transitioning children uh, is considered um, a better way to, to live, but um, evidently it's um, really a really bad way to go. Can I ask you, Kira, how children. much information did the specialists give you when it comes to... I mean, some of this surgery is so invasive and so irreversible. You had a double mastectomy. Uh, Richie had uh, surgery on his genitals. This kind of stuff that is, it cannot be undone, you know? And how much, was t was, how much information was given you in advance of what you would be going through? Nothing besides uh, very basic um, uh, side effects, such as, in my case, facial hair and... Uh, a deepening voice, for example. Um, I wasn't told about any of the, the real issues that, that would uh, come uh, later down the line. Um, they were pretty much uh, content with me saying that I'd done a bit of research online um, and wanted to proceed, and, and they, were, they were pretty much happy with that. Richie, this whole situation strikes me as, as very odd because when... You know, the fact that both in both of your cases, uh, this diagnosis appears to have been rushed through uh, without other avenues necessarily being explored. But activists will say that if doctors do explore those attitudes, consider, for instance, that you might be struggling with your homosexuality or some other depression or some other anxiety, that is branded trans conversion therapy. What do you make of that? I mean, I'd I really wouldn't know because I wasn't asked about all these things. It was just all assumed that this was part of my trans identity. And when I brought up the regret or when I brought up any sort of maybe um, conflicted narrative as to maybe I'm just a little bit too obsessive, it was, well, it was all brought back into that transphobic society and um, the reason isn't you, it's everyone else, basically was the message that uh, we got fed to us. And what sort of reactions have you had since you have detransitioned? I know that, that, that detransitioners uh, are not all that visible. We don't hear about them all that often. But you have both been very, very vocal about it. Richie, have you had a, a, any kind of negative reaction to being open about this? Um, I've had an overwhelmingly um, supportive reaction online from a large group of people, but also, as you said, a negative reaction. Um, it very much feels like you've kind of left a congregation as such um, because now you've like evolved into the highest form of blasphemer and you're out there in the street saying that it's it's got problems, it, it needs looked at. Um, so naturally everyone becomes very defensive and they jump to assumptions too and they talk about these assumptions that I've never even... Uh, voiced myself and you often find yourself defending things you don't believe in, you didn't say, um, and it is a very hostile environment for anyone who wants to speak out against it because the worry is it will be used to ban it completely, which is um, complete hyperbole in my opinion because it will never go away. Those services will always exist in one form or another. Kira, can I ask you a, a similar question? Because I'm interested, because you're, you've been so visible, what with your case with the High Court uh, against the Tavistock, uh, that surely some, you must have had some kind of, re all kinds of reactions, really. Oh, absolutely, yeah, because it was such a, a big case, um, unexpectedly for me. Um, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of people trying to drag me down and trying to discredit me. Um, that, you know, I've been called all sorts of names. Um, and, uh, yeah, they... they they always try and discredit my story because, um, you know, it also plucks a string with um, a lot of these trans rights activists, I believe. Um, and, um, yeah, really, really nasty. Why do you think this that we've, we've reached at this point where, you know, if a young child, a young girl has what are traditionally masculine tastes, maybe in football or that kind of thing, or a young boy is uh, traditionally f effeminate, that we have to somehow, that that's a problem to be fixed? Why can't we just let kids be kids? What do you think's happened there, Kira? 
Um, it's a good question. I think um, that's something I'm still trying to figure out. I'm not sure um, how really um, we're going to kind of be able to coexist in a, in a positive way um, just because it's, it's always been frowned upon in my experience. Um, you know, it's, it's considered a problem once you, once you go past puberty, um, you're not allowed to be a, a tomboy anymore. Or you're not, not allowed to be, um, feminine, a feminine boy. Um, so I think that's something that still needs to be figured out really. Um, yeah, it's yeah, so ingrained I mean in, into society. And Richie, you know, I, I, I mean, because I sort of understand the homophobia aspect. I don't approve of it, obviously, but I understand that homophobia has been something that's been there for a long time. People are very uncomfortable with it. And that prejudice can be sort of explained in a way. But what I don't understand is the idea that children that don't conform very strictly to 1950s stereotypes of what it means to be male and female uh, should, should be fixed, I suppose, through medical intervention. Where do you think it's come from? Um, I believe it originated from mainly from WPATH standards of care seven, where in 2011 we adopted the affirmation only approach. And that approach and model itself was funded by um, interests that would have benefited from it and they have. Um, and I do think the world does need to look at the organization WPATH and we need an alternative to WPATH because a lot of this has also come from good intentions, you know. Um, whenever there's a debate about trans women in sports or anything like that, it it all comes from this uh, space of people believe that they're doing the right thing. And I believe a lot of it comes down to this affirmation at all costs um, approach, which originated in 2011. And do you think uh, that had more people said to you, you know, you're an effeminate gay man and there's nothing wrong with that, that maybe you might have taken a different path? Maybe, but we'll never know. Kira, do you think the same? I mean, do, do you think if more people have sort of suggested that there's nothing wrong with being gay, there's nothing wrong uh, with being uh, a tomboy, that maybe you might have, things might have turned out differently? Definitely, yeah. I think there's a good chance because it, it was such a prominent um, issue in my life and um, I didn't see any way out of it really um and yeah i really do think that would have made a big difference and how do you feel about it all now kira because obviously you've been through a lot you've been very public about it and you've had all this as you've described uh, all kinds of responses not all of them pleasant do you have any regrets about anything no not at all no i have no regrets um it's uh, you know it's of course very exhausting to have to kind of repeat my story and uh, in the face of all the um the uh, horrible kind of comments that I receive. Um, so it, it's difficult, but I think, it, of course, it was it was worth it uh, to uh, share my story and, and take the case on. So I'm, I'm very happy that I did that. It's part of the problem that a lot of people, when they listen to the, the stories that you're describing, they sort of just can't really believe it's happening. The idea that there would be an NHS clinic that would step in and, and effectively try and fix gay kids. At the Tavistock, there was that dark joke that among the staff that soon there would be no gay people left. You know, when we hear those sorts of things, uh, it's difficult to believe them. But how prevalent is this, Richie? Um, I think um, the numbers speak for themselves. I think it was, what, an 8,000% increase in referrals over the last several years for uh, young boys and girls um, to these clinics. Um, but I do believe we are on, we are kind of approaching the other side of that. And I, I believe if we look at the numbers in the next few years, you'll see a drastic decrease, which I believe is happening as the trend is, I believe, coming to its life cycle end. Um, which is Can I ask you about detransitioning, though? That, to what, people often say to me, well, there aren't many detransitioners. There aren't many people who regret the surgery they went through. What do you make of that? Um, I obviously think that that is not true. I speak to a lot of detransitioners. Um, I can speak quite uh, well for the male side, um, which is largely underrepresented because there's different dynamics at play, especially when they want to speak out publicly. Um, and I also believe that a lot of males, especially because of the way males are socialised generally, tend to go off and do their own thing um, and just go off and live the life. And the, that's that is a real healthy detransition, which is to separate yourself from the identity politics and just go back to your life, go back to normality and go back to the things that are healthy and good for you.
And Kira, in the early days of the Tavistock, it was mostly um, boys. Uh, there weren't many, but there were some mostly boys who were coming in, uh, struggling with their gender identity. But now it seems that predominantly this is affecting teenage girls. Uh, why do you think this might be? Um, I, I believe um, it's it's been uh, kind of viewed as an easy way out of um, just the struggles of uh, female puberty, I believe. I believe that's a big one. Um, you know, uh, girls are becoming more and more kind of aware of um, uh, being objectified um, and, and different issues like that. And so um, transition is kind of seen as a way to evade all of that. And, um, you know, it can be very awkward um, growing up as a, as a girl and, and a boy, I'm sure. Um, but I can only speak to my experience. And I know that um, I, I, I definitely um, kind of uh, jumped to any chance of, of evading the issues that I was going through as a result of puberty. Well, I really appreciate both of you telling your stories because this is obviously a very sensitive subject. And, uh, and thank you very much for speaking out and being on the show with me tonight, Kira and Richie. Thanks a lot. In a statement, the Cumbria Northumberland Tynan Ware NHS Foundation Trust said it could not comment on an individual, but it added, quote, care plans are collaborative and tailored to each patient's needs and goals, and treatment decisions are made following a thorough assessment in line with national recommendations.